welcome to the sponsored program by BCTV on ranked choice voting. We have John Monroe here from the League of Women Voters, and he is going to explain how ranked choice voting works, and hopefully when we're all done, we'll kind of understand this process. John, thank you for joining us this evening, and I'm going to let you take it away. All right, thanks for having me. Oh, we're going to need to uh, get the uh, overhead going. warm-up period okay okay well thanks for joining us and what I'm going to be talking about here uh, is how we got ranked choice voting in the first place uh, what it means for how you're going to be casting your ballots in in June and how those ballots are going to be counted um, so I'm just going to uh, first of all start off by showing you um, an example of a ranked choice ballot uh, for governor. Uh, this would be the, uh, the Republican primary election and as you can see uh, just as always the names of the candidates are uh, in the first row and but, but we have five columns this time around. We have a first choice column, a second choice column, a third choice column, a fourth choice and a fifth choice column. Uh, there's actually four candidates and one write-in and that's why we have the, uh, the fifth choice uh, column available. Uh, so how did we get here? Why are we using this kind of ballot uh, for June, which we haven't used in the past? Uh, what is the purpose of ranking candidates? Um, it, now, in, in one way you could think of the ranking of the candidates as it's simply a way to express how you feel about the various candidates. I have a favorite, I have a second favorite, I have one that I'm kind of indifferent to, I may have one that's my least favorite, but that's not really the purpose of a ranked choice ballot. Uh, the purpose of this ballot is actually so that we can hold a kind of uh, runoff election. Uh, the purpose of ranked choice uh, voting is actually to elect a candidate uh, with a majority of voter support. So the idea behind this is actually to get us to the point where we have a candidate who has at least uh, half of the voter support in either first choice votes, second choice votes, third choices, uh, etc. At some point or another the winner of, of a ranked choice election has to have some combination of first choice, second choices, etc. Uh, that that, that makes up a majority of the ballots cast. Um, so why is this necessary? Well, in an ordinary runoff election, uh, you would have a runoff election uh, in a majority election uh, when one of the candidates, when no, excuse me, when none of the candidates manage to get a majority of the votes. Then no one gets more than 50%. Now, in a traditional runoff, uh, what that would mean is you would have to print a whole bunch of uh, ballots, call people back to the voting place on another day. And so what you would have is a, a, a lot of inconvenience for voters, uh, great expense for the state in, in printing new ballots, paying poll workers, et cetera. And, uh, and you would also have fewer voters because a lot of people simply aren't going to return. Uh, to, to vote on another day, so fewer people are going to decide the result of an election. Using this ballot, what the voter is doing is, that, is telling the election uh, authorities what they want to happen in the event that their first choice candidate is eliminated from the race in any round of uh, counting of the votes. So, for example, uh, in this example, which is for the Republican primary for governor, uh, if my first choice had been Ken Fredette, and Ken Fredette, for any reason, whether in the first or the second round, was eliminated uh, from the race, uh, then my ballot in the next round uh, would be counted for my second choice candidate, whoever uh, that might be. Uh, everyone else, uh, their ballots would stay uh, put. Uh, with their first choice candidate until such a time as their first choice candidate was also eliminated, if that happened uh, to be the case. Uh, so this ballot is, is simply a way of achieving 
uh, uh, the results of a runoff election without having uh, additional election days, additional uh, printings of uh, ballots, and so on. Uh, what we're doing as voters is, is expressing our preferences, what we want to happen if our first choice uh, is eliminated. So if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, and this is the, uh, uh, an ex uh, a sample ballot for the uh, Democratic candidates for governor and rep representatives to Congress for District 2, and we can, we can go on from that. Now, how did this happen? Um, well, obviously one of the reasons uh, why this happened is because we had uh, a lot of people in the state who are dissatisfied with the old voting system, which is called plurality or first-past-the-post voting, in which uh, basically, the, you win if you have more votes than any other candidate. It doesn't matter if you have 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 or 80 percent of the vote. Uh, those are all winning votes if they're more than, than the, uh, the, the next candidate uh, down. Um, so there was a, uh, a citizens' referendum in 2016. Uh, which asked Maine voters, do they want to uh, give ranked choice voting a try? And that was voted in at a, uh, with 52% uh, of Maine voters deciding that, yes, we did want to give ranked choice voting a try. Um, but there were problems with that because uh, ranked choice voting being a majority voting system, uh, it directly conflicts with Article 4 of the Maine Constitution, which requires Maine state offices to be elected using plurality rules. That is, the, uh, the, the, the winner uh, is declared according to plurality rules, not majority rules. Um, so in 2017, in response to this uh, anticipated constitutional conflict, uh, the Maine state legislator passed a bill which would delay the implementation of ranked choice voting until 2022 uh, and contingent upon there having been an amendment to the, uh, the state constitution in the interim period uh, which would allow uh, majority rule elections. Um, in response to that 2017 bill, then a, uh, a, a group of citizens then launched a petition to veto that bill, the veto the delay in the implementation of ranked choice voting, and that petition was certified uh, this year and is now on the ballot uh, in June. Uh, now, because that veto petition is on the ballot, then the 2017 law is held in abeyance. That is, we can't enforce that law while there's a citizen's uh, uh, petition uh, that we're voting on. Uh, so until we complete the vote on the citizen's petition uh, in June, um, the 2000, we, we have to uh, obey the 2016 law, which was passed by citizens' uh, referendum. Uh, which, uh, which is the, uh, the ranked choice voting law. Um, now, I, I go into this because this creates a rather confusing um, situation and uh, legally uh, for people to understand. Why is it legal to have a ranked choice election, uh, for example, for governor uh, in the June primary, uh, but it's not legal to have a ranked choice election for governor, for example, in the November general election. Um, these are things that people naturally find very confusing. Um, and this, these are problems that arose because of all the legislation that has been happening over the last few years about ranked choice voting. Um, so let's try to clear that up. Um, ranked choice voting is the law. It is the lawful uh, voting system for use in the June uh, primary. And it does conflict with the Maine Constitution. Um, so how do we work that out? Well, here's the thing. Uh, this is a primary election, and the Maine Constitution does not apply to primary elections. In fact, primary elections are not elections. They are the nominations processes of political parties. Um, so this is really a kind of a problem with language. We've gotten in the habit of calling primary elections elections, and so people tend to assume that they're governed by the same laws as our other elections. Uh, but the Maine Constitution doesn't actually say anything about primaries. In fact, primaries didn't exist when the Constitution 
uh, was written. Um, <clears throat> so the, what, the reason why we can uh, have uh, these primary nominations in June then using RCV is because they're simply not covered uh, by the main constitution. Uh, federal offices also are not covered under the main constitution. Uh, the uh, main constitution does not specify uh, the voting uh, methods or the vote counting methods for a president or for a U.S. Senator or U.S. Congress. Uh, those things are determined by ordinary legislation, not constitutional amendment. Um, and currently, uh, elections for federal offices can be, uh, can be, the methods that we use to elect those offices can be changed by changes to the law. And that change, in fact, was made in 2016 when the voters uh, passed the citizens' referendum that uh, brought uh, ranked choice voting. So f it's okay for federal offices. So in November, um, we will be able to elect um, federal offices using ranked choice voting, but we will not be able to elect state offices using ranked choice voting because in November we're having elections for office. Those are real elections and those are covered by the main constitution and so if we did have an election for a governor, say, in, uh, in November using ranked choice, that would be in direct conflict with the main constitution. That's not allowed and so we're not doing it. Um, so that in, in, in brief uh, is, is the legal situation and, and the reason um, why we can have a ranked choice election in June for governor but not in November is simply because of what laws apply and to which elections and, and uh, that, uh, that has been the cause of some confusion I know among members of the public uh, for quite some time. Um, and we, can, we can go on from now. Okay, now <laughs> at this point then um, I'm going to uh, uh, go on, get away from real elections and into to a pretend election. And so this is so that we can kind of uh, talk about how to cast and count a ranked choice ballot. And this is really what what should be of most concern uh, to Maine voters is uh, how do I cast my ballot correctly and what's going to happen to it uh, after I, I put it in the ballot box. Uh, to demonstrate this, I'm going to use a fake election, uh, an election for a, a symbol of Maine. And the candidates in that election are going to be uh, Moose, uh, Pine Tree, uh, Puffin, and a blueberry. Uh, sorry, lobster is not an option on the menu. Uh, so, uh, neither is, uh, some people mentioned lighthouses as a possibility, but I had to point out that lighthouses are not a life form, so they can't stand for election. Uh, but uh, this is, these are the four choices that we decided on for our, our fake election. Now, how would you cast uh, a ranked choice ballot for that? Well, I could decide that I like blueberry first and I would fill out uh, in the first choice column, I would, I would mark the oval for blueberry. I might like puffin second and so in the second column, I would mark uh, this, uh, the, the puffin as my second choice and in the third column, I might go for pine tree and in the fourth, my least favorite I guess would be moose. Um, Now people wonder then, what's going to, how is this going to be counted along with thousands of other ballots? How do we figure out who's a winner uh, when, when people are marking first choices, second choices, third choices, and so on? And one way to demonstrate this is, is instead of using a, a paper ballot like this, like, such as you might fill out on election day, uh, I'm going to use some cards. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some pictures. So I have a blueberry, a puffin, a pine tree, and a moose. And I'm going to put them in order with my first choice on top and my second choice second and so on. Okay. So what's going to happen on election day? Well, on election day when I turn in this ballot, my ballot basically for this office looks like this. 
Blueberry is on top. My, my first choice is blueberry. So in the first round of counting, which is the counting of the first choices, my ballot counts for blueberry. Well, let's say that blueberry uh, is eliminated in the first round, and there is no majority winner for this election. So we're going to need to go to a second round of counting. Um, well, uh, my ballot in the first round said blueberry. Blueberry is not in the election anymore, so I can't vote for blueberry again in the second round. So now my ballot is going to look like this. I'm going to go to the second round voting for Puffin. Well, let's say in the next round there's still no majority winner and Puffin has, has the least number of votes. So Puffin is going to be eliminated. Well, my ballot's going to move again. And this time it's going to go to my third choice, uh, which is Pine Tree. And by the third round, we should have a winner. It's either going to be Moose or Pine Tree. Um, so my ballot isn't necessarily going to stay with the same candidate throughout the election. Now, the first two candidates in this fake election that I just mentioned to get eliminated were Puffin and Blueberry. That means in the final round, uh, the two candidates were Pine Tree and Moose. Um, so let's say that I had voted for Pine Tree as my first choice. If I had voted for Pine Tree as my first choice, I would have voted for Pine Tree in the first set round, I would have voted for Pine Tree again in the second round, and I would have voted for Pine Tree again in the third round. But because as long as my first choice candidate is in the race, why would I switch? I'm not going to switch to my second choice while my first choice is still in the race. So your first choice vote is going to be used as long as your first choice candidate remains in the race. The only way that your first choice uh, candidate is not going, your first, for, excuse me, your first choice, choice vote is not going to be used is if your first choice candidate is eliminated. Okay? So let's go through, uh, so that was just looking at one ballot. Now let's look at an, an entire election. So let's go through and see what so let's say we had uh, an election with uh, 100 voters, and in the first round, uh, Moose gets 40 votes, Pine Tree gets 35, Puffin gets 15, and Blueberry is in last place with 10. Um, so just as I mentioned before, there's no winner in this round. Uh, 40 is not enough votes uh, to win. Uh, we, need, we would need more than 50 in order to win, so there's 100, so 100 divided by 2 is 50, and we need to get over that threshold in order to declare a winner. Uh, so the, the, the winner would have to have at least 51 votes in this election. So what's going to happen then uh, after the first round of counting is over, and that's the first, that's what's going to happen on election night, by the way. And on election night, the town clerks are going to be counting first choice votes and declaring or releasing to the public the results of the, the, of the count of, of everybody's first choices. So what we're going to get on election night is a first choice vote result rather than a full uh, election result. Um, so in this case, they would say, uh, they would declare 40, 35, 15, and 10 as the result of the first choice vote, and they would say there's no winner in the first round, so the, the, uh, the election is going to be decided by a central count of the votes in Augusta, um, which would take place over the next six or seven days. So now we have to go to a second round because there's no winner. Uh, the last place candidate is going to be eliminated and the ballots that were cast for the last place candidate are now going to move uh, to other candidates. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So we have to look at those ballots and find out, okay, who did Blueberry supporters specify as their second choices? Who did they specify, uh, who did they want their votes to go to if their first choice was eliminated. Uh, so three of them said Moose, seven of them said Pine Tree, and zero uh, cast second choice votes for Puffin. And so the second choice count then would look like this on the next slide. 
Uh, we, we have our first choice votes from the first round of counting plus the, the add-ons from uh, the eliminated candidate. So Moose now has 40 plus 3, Pine Tree has 35 plus 7, and Puffin has 15 plus 0 because they didn't get any second choice uh, votes from uh, Blueberry supporters. So in round two, uh, Moose has advanced a little bit, Pine Tree has advanced a little bit, but we still don't have a winner. So we have to go to a round three. Um, and in round three, Puffin is going to be eliminated because Puffin is in last place. So we find by looking at Puffin's ballots uh, that uh, ten of those voters specified Moose as their second choice and five specified Pine Tree. Uh, so now we're going to add those into the totals. And now we find that uh, Moose has 53 votes and Pine Tree has, what does that look like? 47, <laughs> for those of you who are good at math. Yes. <laughs> so now we have a winner in round three. So, and that's basically how a ranked choice uh, election is counted. Now, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that uh, because, um, for example, uh, not everyone is going to specify a second choice uh, on their ballot. Some people are going to specify a first choice and they may just say, well, I can't decide among any of these other candidates or they may not want to for some reason, and that's okay. Uh, but if that is the case, then, then their ballot, if, if their first choice candidate is eliminated in any round, is going to be what we call exhausted. That means there's nothing further that, that, that can be counted on that ballot. Once the first choice candidate is gone, you know, the election officials can't decide who your second choice is there. So it's like you decided not to show up for the runoff election or you decided to abstain. Uh, so that means that in these successive rounds of elections, the number of uh, voters is actually going to decline a little bit as ballots are exhausted, as voters abstain from giving additional preferences, you know, second, third, or fourth preferences. You, ballots are exhausted and the number of ballots that are counted in each round is going to go down. So the number of ballots that we're counting, say, in round three in a real election uh, is probably going to be somewhat lower than the ballots that were counted in the first round. Um, so, and that also means, therefore, that the number that, that, that's required to reach a majority is going to be smaller. So for, we had 100 voters in this election from beginning to end. That means that the threshold to reach a majority was 50 at the beginning and 50 at the end. But in a real election, the threshold is going to get smaller as you go through successive rounds. And so you might start off with 50 as your, as your majority threshold, but by the third round it may, it may actually be uh, you know, 46 votes required to reach a majority, which will still be half or slightly more than half because you're using a different total of uh, ballots cast. Okay. Okay. And so that brings us to the issue of, of how, uh, how should voters mark the ballot. Um, now, a, a correctly marked ballot, or probably you know, the best way to mark a ballot, is to have uh, one mark <clears throat> in a column. If you're going to mark a column at all, that is, if you're going to mark a, a, a first choice, a second choice, a third choice, etc., uh, there should only be one mark in that column. You can't have two candidates as your first choice or two candidates as your second choice, even if you think they're about equal, <laughs> you know, um, because it's impossible for the election officials to understand how to cast that ballot. You know, so one, one or the other has to get the ballot, so has to get the vote, and, and they, they, can't, uh, they can't decide how to cast that ballot if you have two candidates as a first choice or two candidates as a second choice. So a correctly marked ballot will have only one mark in any column. Um, <clears throat> now, 
as you're going through the ballot, though, and marking those columns, say I'm marking a first choice, a second choice, you may reach a point where you decide that for some reason that you don't want to mark any more, and that's perfectly fine. But that just means that if you reach a, it, it may reach a point in the election where your ballot may be exhausted. Uh, that is, your first choice candidate may get eliminated in the first round, your second choice candidate may get eliminated in the second round, and then we get to the third round if there is one and there's nothing left on your ballot to count, so it's just going to be a blank. And that may be what you want, because if you don't really have any preference between the remaining candidates, then you're really indifferent about the result, um, so that may be fine for you. Uh, but if you have any preference at all between uh, any of the remaining uh, candidates, it's probably in your best interest to keep marking the ballot for as long as you can. As long as you have any preference at all, any candidate that you think is better than any of the, any of the remaining candidates, um, just keep marking the ballot. Uh, it's, it doesn't hurt your first choice candidate if you mark a second or a third choice, because the only way we're going to be counting second or third choices in that election is if your first choice candidate is eliminated. If your first choice candidate is eliminated and you, you haven't marked your true second choice, a candidate that you really thought was better than the, than the, remaining, uh, the other remaining candidates, then you've really done yourself a disservice, uh, probably thinking that you were hel somehow helping your first choice candidate by doing that, but really you can't. If your first choice candidate is eliminated, once they're eliminated, uh, that's it. You, so it's, you know, it's kind of, it's time to move on, um, okay? <coughs> so, um, so here's an example of something that people ask a lot about is, um, uh, and on this particular example, and this is a double, uh, an example of a double-ranked candidate, we have a candidate who's been marked as both the first and the second choice. And sometimes people will ask me, well, if I really like a candidate, should I mark them across the board as, you know, as my first, second, third, or f and fourth choice, et cetera? Um, well, the, re the answer to that is, is simply no. Um, and the reason is is essentially because of what I, I just w was talking about a few moments earlier. The only reason that your second choice uh, vote will ever be used is if your first choice is eliminated. So if you mark the same candidate first and second, um, well, if your first, ch candid first choice candidate is eliminated, your second choice can't be used for that candidate because they're not in the race anymore. So, and if you mark first, second, third, and fourth for the candidate across the board, then after that candidate is eliminated, there's nothing left to count on that ballot. So that would, it would be the same as if you marked ba uh, 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 the ballot blank after your first choice. Um, so double ranking the candidates or triple ranking a candidate that you really like is really not uh, a, a good strategy. It's not going to help your first choice candidate and it's just preventing you from exercising, you know, the full range of, uh, uh, of the choice that you're given uh, with ranked choice voting. Uh, now what will happen if you cast your ballot like this? Well, it's not going to invalidate your ballot. The ballot will still be counted, but what's going to happen is is say if, if in this example candidate A, which, which is marked as both the first and the second choice, is eliminated in any round, well, they can't use the second choice marking because candidate A is no longer there, so candidate C, which is marked as the third choice, is actually going to be counted as the second choice because they're the next in rank order. Okay, you can go on to the next one. Um, now this is uh, the overvote, what's called an overvoted ballot, and this was uh, an example I was talking about earlier where uh, two candidates are given the same ranking. Now in this case, candidate A and candidate B have both been marked uh, as a second choice. Um, an overvoted uh, ballot creates a serious problem for election administrators because it's impossible for them to, to tell what the voter's intention was. And what would happen if you, if you cast a, a ballot in this way 
is, is that uh, the vote, excuse me, the, uh, the ballot would be considered exhausted uh, starting at the column where the mistake was made. So in this example, the mistake is made in the second choice column. We have candidate A and candidate B both marked as second choices. So this ballot is considered exhausted from the second choice on. So that fourth choice marking that you see for candidate D would not be counted either. So that ballot is exhausted after uh, the first choice has been counted. Now notice that the first choice would be counted in this example. Uh, so candidate C would still get that voter's first choice vote. It's just that after that, uh, the ballot is considered exhausted. There's not, nothing further that uh, can be counted from that ballot. Um, this example here is called a skipped ranking. And what has happened here is that the voter has marked a first choice, candidate A, but hasn't marked a second choice, and then went on to mark a third choice. Um, now, this is, this is different than, uh, than the case where, for example, a voter might mark a first choice and then leave the rest of the ballot blank. Uh, they've posed uh, something uh, of a problem here for the election officials, is how do we understand what the voter's intention here is? Um, well, the way this would be counted is, is very simple. Um, since there's no second choice marked, the third choice will be used as the voter's second choice. Um, and, and then the fourth choice would be bumped up to third, uh, and so on. Um, and that probably makes a lot of intuitive sense. Uh, you know, this is probably a simple error on the voter's part, and probably that third choice really was the voter's second choice. But may, in some cases, that may not have been the case. They may have simply forgotten to mark that column and didn't notice the mistake and, and, and uh, put their ballot in the ballot box with the mistake, with the mistake uncorrected. Uh, that could happen. And so you really need to be aware of, of these kinds of errors, because these are a, a kind of error that you couldn't make on, on the old style of ballot, and to make sure that you check your ballot before you turn it in to make sure that you don't have any uh, unintended blank columns in there because they will be, your ballot will still be counted, but there's a chance that you may have a candidate with a lower ranking bumped up that you didn't intend. Now this is a case of a double skipped rank, and here the voter has marked a first choice, then skipped two columns, and then marked uh, a fourth Choice. And in this case, this would be treated basically the same as an overvote. So at the point that where the mistake was made, nothing further will be counted on this ballot. So in this ballot, um, it, this ballot is exhausted after the first choice has been counted. So the first choice will be counted. That voter's vote for candidate A will be counted. Uh, but second and third choices, which are blank, of course, cannot be counted. But the fourth choice will not be elevated to the second choice or, uh, position. Uh, that will simply be treated as a blank. So this is basically, at this point, an exhausted ballot. Um, and the reason for this is very simple, and, and is they've, they've simply decided in the Secretary of State's office that it is, it is uh, too difficult or, or too much of a jump uh, to assume th that, uh, that these two uh, blank columns were uh, a simple mistake uh, by the voter and that they really intended for that fourth, uh, uh, the fourth choice candidate to be their, their second choice. That's too much of a, a leap of faith. <laughs> um, so they decided uh, that it would made more sense to simply exhaust the ballot after, at the point in which, excuse me, at the point in which the mistake was made. <coughs> okay. Um, so I guess we'll hold off on this one for, for just a little while. Um, so there are a, a, a few different kinds of mistakes then that can be made on a ranked choice ballot uh, that you couldn't make on, on an old plurality style ballot. And because of that, because these are more complex ballots where you have more columns, of choices, and there are simply more choices to make on a ranked choice ballot, you have to be a little bit more cautious uh, about uh, 
turning in uh, your, your ballot without checking it first. And what I would suggest is that every voter, before they turn their ballot in, check every column and make sure that there isn't more than one uh, oval mark in any given column. They should check every row to make sure there isn't more than one uh, oval marked in any row. And they should also check for any blank columns where there are no ovals marked at all and make sure that the, that the voter uh, did that on purpose. Um, and if you do those things before you turn in your ballot, you, will, you should catch any, any mistake that you could possibly make on this ballot. Um, now, the, and it's also important to remember, though, that uh, if you do make a mistake in marking your ballot, it isn't necessarily going to invalidate or cause your entire ballot to be exhausted. It's, you know, there will be rules followed in counting those ballots, and in most cases, at least your first choice uh, vote would, would count for your, your favorite candidate. Okay, now we can go on. Now, in the, uh, in the June election, uh, we're, we're also going to be having a referendum vote. And the refer referendum vote also happens uh, to have something to do with ranked choice voting. Uh, the language of the referendum vote um, is very difficult to understand. And in fact, I, I just got a call earlier today from a concerned uh, voter who basically said, I, I, I don't understand whether a, a yes or a no vote on this people's veto is a vote for or against ranked choice voting. Um, so let's go through the language uh, of, the, uh, of the referendum first to give you an idea of what, that, uh, what was confusing to that voter. And then I'll just give you a, a, a simple rule to follow for understanding how this people's veto is going to work. Uh, the people's veto says, do you want to reject the parts of a new law that would delay the use of ranked choice voting in the election of candidates for any state or federal office until 2022, and then retain the method only if the Constitution is amended by December 1st, 2021, to allow ranked choice voting for candidates in state elections? Well, that's worse than taxes. Um, that's really hard to understand. Uh, but basically, what it's saying is, 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 is very simple. Uh, a yes vote, a yes to veto, is a yes for ranked choice voting. A no to the veto is a no, I don't want ranked choice voting. So yes, I want ranked choice, or no, I don't want ranked choice. Uh, it's really that simple. Um, and uh, the, you know, the language, unfortunately, that's, that's used in, in the referendum really isn't going to help you to sort it out very much. Okay, well that's, uh, that's the end of the formal uh, presentation uh, portion, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. <laughs> hmm? okay. We're all good. Oh. good all right, great. <laughs> Thank to go. you very much for that presentation. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I'm sure that the voters at home hopefully will be doing this mm -hmm. and um, looking at it before we have the elections on the 12th. Mm -hmm. um, if they have any questions, could they contact you? Uh, yes, actually, they can. Okay. Um, How would they do that? Uh, well, they can uh, use my email address, and that's uh, jon at Maine, as in the state of Maine, maincleanelections.org. Uh, um, they can also uh, visit our website, which is maineusesrankchoice.vote, uh, uh, V-O-T-E, uh, on the web, and, um, and there is a, a link there to, uh, to, for uh, uh, referring okay. questions. All right. And I know that you can also come into the town offices and talk to the clerk's office if you have any questions as well. There'll be people available that day to answer your questions when you come in. So um, thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate your time and hopefully you will have no questions when you do come on that day because you'll have watched this. Yeah. Thank you. And just remember it's really quite simple. Uh, just rank your, uh, your candidates as, as many as you can. Uh, if you don't use the entire uh, ballot, that's fine. It won't, it won't hurt your first choice candidate. It won't cause your ballot to be invalidated. 
Um, so uh, just relax and, and enjoy a new experience. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ah, thank you.